<laughs> hey, Mark. So this uh, complaint, if you haven't seen this right here, I mean, everybody else has seen it. You've seen it right here. It's, uh, it's the SEC versus John Fife and all of his uh, Chicago Ventures, all of his aliases. So the SEC is charging John Fife with failing to register as a dealer under the Securities Act. John Fife offers convertible promissory notes that turn into stock. And that sounds like walks like a duck, talks like a duck, must be a duck. They've written over 250 notes with approximately 135 companies. That's just amazing. The SEC meticulously in this document outlined infraction by infraction how John Five works. Now the SEC issued an order requiring John Five to disgorge jointly and severely the ill-gotten gains that they received directly or indirectly, including prejudgment interest. And the SEC is asking courts to pay, ba pay back the issuers, basically. So you know why these uh, toxic debt holders arrived at this place, why they, why they got here. There's because, you know, in the uh, OTC markets, capital resources are very scarce in the small cap market. And these companies like John Five are basically just predators because these guys have no other sources to go to. So, but, but any company that takes the debt is immediately flagged by investors and their stock is punished. Now we're private, uh, part of a private investment fund. Now, when we see toxic debt on the books, there are ways to remove that legally. It's, you know, they use a 3A10, but these guys will call them. They don't want to talk to us. We could tell them the story where, where it's bad for the company, it's bad for the stock, where it's bad for the shareholders, but they don't care. And, you know, we don't want to invest in a company into a bucket where there's actually holes in the bucket and because they're not going to work with us. So um, the SEC order reads like a nail in the coffin to uh, toxic debt companies. And it's a limit because they have unlimited amounts of money to work with. So, so I got a question for you. Does this mean if I'm an OTC company and I have toxic debt, can I join this suit? Or at the minimum, do these charges, this complaint by the SEC, kind of give me the power to go to my SEC attorney or my attorney or to you and go to that debt holder, which is, let's say, it's John Five, and renegotiate, and why? And, like, lastly, I, I see this as an injunction for any future practice or similar. Will this companies like John Five, are they going away forever? Well, those are all really good questions, John. So let's understand a little bit of the history of this first, right? This is nothing new for the SEC to go after – a toxic lender. I mean, they've been going after toxic lenders sporadically since as early as 1995. It's just that in the last seven to 10 years, the terms of these toxic lending instruments are so egregious and so detrimental to the OCC companies that issuers and their shareholders have filed numerous complaints to the SEC uh, with regard to these types of transactions. Um, so, what can an OTC company do? Um, well, right now, the environment seems to be uh, a, a tidal swell against the toxic lenders. Uh, it's not only John Fife, it's Ibrahim Almagarbi, it's John D. Fierro, it's Justin Keener, uh, it's Ed Lasega with River North. And to understand what the corporations and the companies can do, you first have to understand what has happened in the court system in the uh, Southern District of Florida, in the uh, Ibrahim Almagarbi case, as well as the Justin Keener case, at least in the Almagarbi Almagar case, uh, the United States Court for the Southern District of Florida found the identical um, fact pattern, engagement of business, of buying and selling these convertible notes as a business, um, and granted summary judgment to uh, the SEC. With regard to the Justin Keener case, Justin Keener's attorneys, uh, through that Hail Mary, they tried to make a motion to dismiss the case, claiming the trader exemption, and the United States District Court uh, in Southern District of Florida, a different judge, denied them that motion. The SEC just made a similar motion for summary judgment as they had done in the River North 
and the Almagarbi case. Why is this important? Um, I think recently uh, the SEC in the last year, the River North, John DeFiero, Justin Keener, Almagarbi, and now the Fife case, they had decided that those were the five most egregious potential offenders under the Securities Act uh, in engaging in the business of buying and selling securities. Hence the, the favorable decisions by the SEC in those actions so far. We're still waiting on the Fierro case to see whether that motion to dismiss will hold water, but I have a feeling it's gonna to fall to the wayside like all the other prior decisions. So what does this mean to the OTC market in general? I, I think it's, it's, it's the Hiroshima bomb going off uh, on toxic lenders. I know for a fact that I've been retained by dozens of small cap uh, OTC markets trading companies in the last three years. And we've been litigating with them in court, uh, mostly on the issue of criminal usury under state law. And now we just happen to have um, a case that's going to the New York Court of Appeals that the United States uh, Court of Appeals for the Second Circuit couldn't decide because they didn't understand the law. They kicked it to the highest court in New York for an interpretation of that law. We think we're going to be successful. But that's a whole other issue of state law that, that the lenders um, may be able to, to pursue. Uh, with, with regard to uh, the issue of uh, the SEC seeking disgorgement, as, as you indicated. There was a recent case uh, by the United States Supreme Court over the summer called Louis versus the SEC. And it dealt with specifically disgorgement. And the SEC, uh, sorry, the United, States Court of, uh, the United States Supreme Court found that when there is an order of disgorgement, the disgorgement should go to the harmed parties. Now, I interpret that to be the harm parties are the issuers and its shareholders, or it's the issuers representing in their fiduciary capacity, their shareholders. The problem is, and let's just take hypothetically um, in the uh, River North case, since we have a summary judgment already in that matter, and they're proceeding to disgorgement. So let's say that River North did a hundred transactions but say your OTC company only did one transaction with River North for say $100,000. We're not sure how big the pool for disgorgement will be. I, they're guessing in that case it could be 20, $30 million. But if you spread that over a hundred different OTC market companies with thousands of shareholders each, what is each piece of the pie? Who gets, who gets the piece of the pie from the disgorgement? Is it the ones with the greater amount of notes, uh, the ones with the higher amount of, of loans? Is it the amounts that, uh, is it the, the companies that issued more stock than the company next to them with the same type of loan uh, from, from River North? So we're not really sure yet, but we've already put together a, a program where um, we can help the OTC companies put together an administrative uh, package that will be ready to be filed with the SEC once the court ordered disgorgement is in place. So that's one thing you can do. You can wait on the SEC disgorgements. And for those companies that don't have convertible notes anymore with those lenders, that's probably all you can do at this point. If you now, if you have existing notes with those lenders or new notes um, with similar lenders that haven't been the target yet of the SEC. And I say yet because I have a very strong feeling there are two or three other uh, very egregious uh, uh, business models coming out of New York and Massachusetts that are currently uh, the SEC may be looking at, but I don't know the names of the, the, the lenders. So the second thing other than waiting for disgorgement is if you currently have notes you can bring an action under the same provision and the same exact fact pattern and business model as the SEC did as a private right because the, the, SEC, the Securities Act requires these lenders to register as a dealer if they're buying and selling securities in their own name at a certain volume. That volume seems to be more than 30 or 40 transactions a year. 
A lot of these guys have done 80, 100, 200 transactions a year. So you can bring an action uh, on behalf of a small cap, micro cap company trading on the OTC that has these convertible debts. Uh, under 15 USC 78O, which is the failure to register, the requirement to register and the failure to register as a dealer. Funny, a little further down the statutory framework is 15 USC 78 small double C. And that says a violation of this act voids the underlying transaction. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Now, this is exactly why the SEC is going after disgorgement. However, the United States Supreme Court in, uh, in the Mills case uh, about a decade and a half ago said that if there's a violation of the Securities Act and you're harmed or you're in the class of individuals that is harmed, under 29B, you have a private right of action against that same violator. But the difference is, instead of a disgorgement action, which is a monetary reward, the companies now have a right under 29B to seek rescission of that and all of their agreements because the, the, these toxic lenders, which I refer them to as toxic lenders, uh, were unauthorized to enter into those transactions because they did not register as a dealer. That's aside from any 10B5 securities fraud claims that you have or any other uh, shareholder derivative action claims against these, uh, um, these what I would call bad actors uh, for claims under state law for, for criminal usury violations, which void transactions as well, uh, for fraudulent conveyances, because every time you issue stock, you're issuing it at a steep discount. You're not getting the reasonably equivalent value for the stock that you that you uh, that you issue, and a lot of small cap companies are filing Chapter 11, and and are are just go and the trustees in the Chapter 7 case and the debtors in possession in the Chapter 11 cases, are going after these note holders on the theory of fraudulent conveyance, right? So if 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 I have a hundred thousand dollars worth of debt, you have to give me according to the terms of our agreement $175,000 worth of stock. So I paid you $100,000 for $175,000 worth of stock. I did not pay the reasonably equivalent value. And under state law and under bankruptcy law, you can look back anywhere between a year or up to four years of all the transactions that have been on your books to get a judgment to recoup the value of all that money. Why? Because they never registered as a dealer. So they were unauthorized at all to enter into that agreement. I, I really hate recommending litigation, although my firm is one of the leading firms in this toxic debt litigation um, in the country. I rather try to see if there's an amicable workout because litigation is expensive. A lot of the OTC companies, by the time they realize or by the time they're being sued by these toxic funders are basically out of money or out of resources. And unfortunately, the toxic lenders have an abundance of money, an abundance of resources to litigate the heck out of the situation. And they usually win by a war of attrition that, you know, halfway through the lawsuit, it's going well, the defense against a breach of contract or to convert shares, um, but the companies run out of money. And at that point, there's not much that anybody can do to help the company. So I think, I think a, better, uh, a better approach is what we have been doing with uh, small public companies, private restructurings and workouts. Now, a lot of CEOs, though I've been the CEO of two public companies myself, so I've stood in their shoes. I've had toxic convertible debt. I've had to go to court. I was fortunate to beat them back, even on my personal guarantees. I didn't have to pay a dime. So, but I understand the stress, but there's also the optics, right? All the shareholders want you to fight, but you may lose the war of attrition based upon resources if you can't fund the litigation. So on the flip side, if you think about doing a private uh, restructuring and workout, that kind of, that, that resolves a lot of issues for companies that have already uh, experienced tremendous, tremendous dilution from these conversions. Uh, and I'll, I'll tell you why, John. The reason why is because in a restructuring and a workout, we can handle 
all the debt on the books and move that debt from a liability off the books into something else, into a longer term equity. Then we can, at the same time, we can recapitalize the company through reverse splits uh, or whatever the case may be. But because we're restructuring the company, we also can create newish, new classes of convertible preferred securities for management, for the board of directors, to put them back into the position before these uh, unknown mistakes, financial mistakes that were made from the beginning, or by others if you're merging your company into a public company. So although a corporate workout and restructuring, restructuring is a little expensive, it's a lot less expensive than a chapter 11, it, it kind of, the, the purpose of it is to clean up your balance sheet. If, and as you know, as an investor and, and working with investors, John, when you have a clean balance sheet and you don't have the overhang of convertible debt at fixed rate discounts to the market price of your stock, that they can just keep walking the stock price down and keep making the same amount of return, that whether it's they're converting 5,000 or 10,000, they're always gonna get that 54 or 64% extra because of the 30 or 40% discount. Um, it's, it's a lot better uh, to consider restructuring. And, and I'll give you for instance, in the last two years, we've remediated over $71 million of debt for uh, OTC market companies through our restructuring model. Now, I was a chapter 11 attorney before I even founded my first public company. So all I did was borrow, um, you know, some of the concepts of chapter 11, but we apply it privately. So personally, I don't believe in 3A10s. That's my personal belief. First of all, I think they're coming under more and more scrutiny. And I think that's also something that the SEC is looking at because there are some bad actors in that world as well. But all you're really doing is trading one debt for another debt. And at the end of the day, there's the company is still suffering dilution because you're using the stock as repayment, whether it's under a 3A10 or a convertible note. It's, it, it ends up being the same result. And, you know, I've, noticed, I've known uh, OTC companies that were trading at three or $4 and in six months they're trading sub penny. And then the CEOs wonder what happened. And the bigger problem is that the CEOs think they can play a game of catch up. I take one convertible note. In four months, I could take another convertible note and pay off the first convertible note. And then you know what? Three or four months after that, I could take two convertible notes and pay off that one convertible note. But now I have two convertible notes coming due. And next thing you know, um, say your business isn't doing well or some of the press releases you put out uh, with all the positive spin, you know, things just didn't work out, especially COVID has crippled a lot of, a lot of companies' um, goals and benchmarks for the year. So a private restructuring through a workout restructuring, I've done them in three months and I've done some very complicated ones that have taken 12 or 13 months. Uh, but I think the costs associated with the net result far outweighs trying to embattle yourself individually with different litigation um, with, with different note holders in different states. I mean, you may, you know, a, a note holder in, in Massachusetts may sue you. No, two note holders in New York may sue you. A note holder in Texas may sue you. What are you going to do? Hire lawyers in each state and battle them? You're just going to be throwing hundreds of thousands of dollars away in litigation. To what end? I don't know too many attorneys that have been very successful that have gone to the end on this. Um, so I think, I think from an investor standpoint, and in fact, I think every CEO of a public company should view this from an investor standpoint, is how do I make my company more valuable and more attractive to, to sort of mainstream investments? And if you're going to do a convertible note, have a fixed strike price, just like a warrant. Don't make it a floorless and variable rate based upon a discount on your market price, because your market price is going to fluctuate but they're always going to resolve with the same amount of return on every conversion. Just the lower they, your, your price of your stock drops, the more stock they get, the more dilution your shareholders suffer. So to me, the, I think the best route would be a uh, private restructuring and workout.